So ladies and gentlemen, I'd like to say a few words of introduction uh, about our uh, first keynote speaker uh, of the day, uh, His Excellency Ambassador Paul DeWitt. Uh, wait, one moment, one moment, wait. I want to say a few words, a few words are welcome first. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, Ambassador Paul DeWitt holds a master's degree in international and comparative law from the Free University of Brussels, uh, based in Brussels, of course. From 1984 until 1988, he served to several ministries in Belgium, including the, oops, including the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Economic Affairs, as well as the Ministry of Defense. In 1988, he began his diplomatic career as the attaché to the Belgian Embassy in the Demo Democratic Republic of the Congo. From 1991 until 1995, he served as the first secretary at the Belgian Embassy in Budapest and at the permanent representation of Belgium to the EU in Brussels. After that, he served as deputy director at the private office of the Secretary General of NATO. He continued his career within NATO as the deputy head of Euro-Atlantic Partnership and Cooperation Section and counselor for the European Security Directorate at the Political Affairs Division of the International Secretariat at NATO. During his impressive career, Ambassador DeWitt also worked as Director for International Security and Federal Public Service of Foreign Affairs, Foreign Trade, and Development Cooperation in Brussels. The lecture topic that the Ambassador has chosen for today is EU, soft power, and the promotion of democracy in the Mediterranean. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in a very, very warm welcome for His Excellency, Ambassador Paul DeWitt. Thank you for these nice words. Uh, good morning to everybody here. Um, I will um, speak about the EU, not about Belgium. EU, soft power and promotion of democracy in the Mediterranean. The EU's strength, everybody of you know this, um, as a global actor, is not its military power. It is, for uh, a part, its economic influence. Uh, but not only that. An important factor is its reliance on soft power. The EU is uh, globally uh, reckoned with because it is considered a normative power, as Ian Manners qualified this, as opposed to a strictly military or strictly economic power. In spite of all the recent difficulties, Euro crisis, etc., it's still an, a normative power. Europe is the world leader, not in military might, but in the formation of civilization, democracy, welfare and human values. These are not the words of a, uh, some idealist European, but of Kemal Dervish, the former Turkish Minister of Economic Affairs. Some say the EU has been inconsistent in its promotion of democratization and political liberalization in certain regions and in certain times. They are, ri they are right. This is likely due to compelling priorities, especially economic and security concerns, that the EU may actually have valued more highly than political reforms in some regions and at some times. Yet the EU does pursue altruistic foreign policy goals and it has normative power. The EU professes to uphold the normative values of democracy, respect of human rights and the rule of law among others. It frequently attempts or professes to attempt to promote these values beyond its own borders. Europe has an interest in the stable and peaceful progress of the Arab Spring, migration, Disruptions, of, uh, disruptions and failing states are of direct concern to the EU and its member states. It therefore has set the deepening of Arab reform as a key obje objective. The EU has responded to the Arab Spring with a broad range of tools, from humanitarian assistance, the, revi the revision of some modalities of long-term programmatic policies, sanctioning measures and mil military interventionism on part of some member states through NATO, for instance in Libya. The mobilization of such a wide array of tools already represents a shift. One of the outstanding features of Euro-Mediterranean relations was the gap between the creation of broad frameworks and a host of initiatives and their non-implementation, leaving much of the substance of politics to bilateral relations between individual countries. One may ask whether the sum of these tools indicates a shift in EU thinking about its relations with North Africa and the Middle East, and whether it, it, it preludes to a qualitative change. In uh, March and May of last year, the Commission produced two communications which contained the main points for a renewal of Euro-Mediterranean relations, based largely, largely on the review of its European neighborhood policy. However, this neighborhood policy should not be understood as the alpha and omega of the EU's foreign policy in its region. This involves a much broader range of actors and processes, including those of the member states, 
with individual countries in the region. The proposals coming from the Commission and the High Representative Mrs. Ashton require Member States' cooperation for their delivery and implementation. The EU has, the EU has built its revised policies towards the MENA countries, the uh, Mid Middle East and North Africa countries, around four pillars. One, refined conditionality. Two, greater differentiation among countries. Three, new tools to support democracy building. And four, a stronger focus on sustainable socio-economic development. Branded with more for more, the EU has opted for focusing on incentives to characterize the new form of, of engagement. The three M's, more money, more market access, more mobility, are the incentives on offer. These incentives are described in relation to the sanctioning measures which have been progressively put in place against, for instance, the Syrian regime, from the freezing of financial assets to trade and oil embargoes. The emphasis on engagement does not represent a significant departure from previous EU policy, which over the, 20, over the past 20 years has increasingly favoured finding parts of cooperation with partner governments. The difference, at least on paper, is that democratic commitments appear stronger conditions for gaining the additional incentives. The new SPRING programme, it's called SPRING, Support for Partnership Reform and Inclusive Growth, allocates um, about 700 million for the region in 2011 and 2012. Tunisia and Egypt are recipients of additional funding through the uh, neighborhood policy instrument. This, reflect already, this reflects an attempt to differentiate between countries, given the greater diversity within the region, rather than the one-size-fits-all approach of the Euro-Mediterranean partnership and of the European neighborhood policy. In truth, the ENP did contain elements of differentiation and conditionality, offering more integration with the EU to those countries making greater progress, according to agreed benchmarks. The difference now would be in the, in the EU sticking to its principles and promises, the delivery of the incentives, and the general way in which the EU positions itself since the Arab Spring. But emerging dynamics in the region suggest that over the long term the EU needs yet a fundamentally more strategic approach. Much more is needed than small-scale transition-related projects. Some say that even a paradigm shift is called for. From an EU endlessly reiterating resp responsibilities it has to help re reforms, to a more hard-headed look at how Europe needs to repos reposition itself geostrategically in light of changes in its region. Here I would like to make three important points. First, there is no such thing as a global, global Islamist movement. Political Islam has emerged as the main alternative to secular Arab nationalist regimes, whose legitimacy evaporated due to their inability to resolve economic and social problems, to establish the rule of law and to guarantee fundamental freedoms. Some political Islamic trends present risks but they can only be minimized by elaborating intelligent strategies that promote democracy, not by denouncing the results of free democratic choice. The EU must design a strategy to deal with new regimes, including governments and political parties the EU and its member states are not familiar with and even have regarded in the past with suspicion. It is essential for the EU to gain a better understanding of Islamist forces understand how their political tra trajectories have been shaped and how they may evolve in the future. This will provide a sound basis to judge the prospects for democracy in the region. Ignoring Islamist parties and excoriating Islam is no longer viable, as the victory of the RP party in Tunisia's first free elections demonstrates. My second point is that the EU should stop using what it considers politically correct language. Of course, many in the region want European funds, but one cannot help feeling, feeling that the EU's politically correct embrace is met with a cold shoulder in the region. Given the, pa the past hypocrisy in European policies, this should come as no surprise. The EU is paying and will pay for its past misdemeanors. As Richard Youngs stated, 
More than a few speeches claiming humility and many mea culpas will be needed to correct Europe's legitimacy def deficit in the region. The implication of this is that reformers in the region must themselves ulti ultimately sort out their own problems, Europe should, but Europe should help them. Yet it should drop the often heard pretense that we are part of the region and that we are engaged in the creation of a mutually desired project of deep and harmonious political social integration. The EU needs to move beyond its bureaucratic mindset of thinking that a response to the Arab Spring is a matter merely of embellishing existing frameworks like the European neighborhood policy, like the Union for the Mediterranean or the Europe Mediterranean Partnerships, Partnership. Offering more money, more markets and more mobility is part of the equation but does not constitute a geostrategic response to such potentially momentous events. The EU needs a geostrategic vision for where it wants the region to be in the next 10 or 20 years, which problems need to be overcome, and where Europe should be able to work with new regimes on broader global questions. It should work back from that vision to decide which policy changes are appropriate in the short term. If there is a turn towards more social conservatism in the Middle East, this might complicate deep social linkage, linkages and it might not be something Europeans like very much after the courageous democracy protests. But it is not of major geostrategic interest. Geopolitical problems are more likely to flow from the depth of social anger if reform fails, rather than from the inclusion of Islamist parties. Therefore, a too rigid model of economic liberalization is to be avoided. The third point is that the EU should accept locally driven solutions. The region needs more dynamic private sectors to generate jobs, not a return to state socialism. Problems have arisen from the corrupt way in which economies have been liberalized. The key for geoeconomic interest is to support a better quality of economic governance with balanced roles for the state and market. For the time being, the EU should stay broadly in listening mode and accept locally driven solutions. But it must complement this with a clear vision of its own concerns. For the Tunisian Islamist politician Rashid Ghanoushi, the European's top priorities to support the democratic transitions should be a. not divide the protagonists in the Arab Spring countries and b to contribute to the resolution of the huge problem of youth employment. These should be the main priorities of the EU, but also of the US and other relevant external actors. The attitude of the EU towards democratic norms, democratic reform and the Islamists may prove crucial to the democratic future, for instance, of Egypt. If in the context of a future FJP government in Egypt, the EU were to fail to develop cooperative relations with the new authorities, this would be interpreted not just as opposing the Islamists, but as denying the rights of the Arabs to choose their own leaders. It is obvious that the stabilization of Mediterranean and the Middle East will be our main task in the coming years. Turkey would add a great deal to these efforts, since Turkey is a meeting point between the region and Europe. As Volker Ruhr, chairman of the Foreign Relations Committee of the German Bundestag, has stated, a Europeanized Turkey will be the main actor of stabilization of the region. Additionally, Turkey could help Europe to project modernizing values, democratic principles, institutions, the respect of the rule of law, and a more social approach to the market economy with the neighboring Islamic world. One can assume that a fully democratic, prosperous and economically powerful Turkey will project European values across the world and in particular help to foster peace and stability in the Middle East and the Mediterranean. Ladies and gentlemen, we all agree the EU has so far played a rather limited role in the Arab countries, especially during the uprisings. This absence opened up new room for maneuvering for regional actors including Turkey. In order to play a stronger role in the region, the EU should develop relations with regional actors such as Turkey. Its effectiveness in the region can be further enhanced if the EU adopts a model which takes into account 
the changes that have occurred during the Arab Spring and the new actors, for instance, the young, that have emerged. I already said that the essential challenge facing the EU is to define a coherent strategy to support democratic process in the Arab world. One would think this would be easy, given that Europe's states are democratic, but paradoxically, this is not the case. Some European politicians supported authoritarian regimes until the fall of Ben Ali and Mubarak. Recent events have proven that lasting stability can only be achieved through democratic and accountable governments. It is essential to recognize that this must be the starting point of the EU policy to build relations with the region. EU governments must stop viewing Islamic parties with suspicion and question their democratic legitimacy, even when they, they participate in free elections and win. This attitude is inconsistent with the ideals of liberal democracies and it leads Arab citizens to believe that Europeans are hypocritical about democracy, wishing it for those who are like them and not for those who are different. Political anal analyst and activist Azam Majoub, a Tunisian secular intellectual, says he believes that Europeans can contribute to the positive evolution of the ERP and the liberal camp by recognizing the democratic nature of the Tunisian revolution, gaining an understanding of the country's major political parties and by treating all political forces equally. In his recent book, entitled Listening to Unfamiliar Voices, the Arab Democratic Wave, the director of the EU Institute for Strategic Studies, Alvaro de Vasconcelos, made, made four important points. The first thing European governments must do is to recognize that they have not always supported Arab democratic aspirations in the past and work to overcome the causes of this past reticence. Only then will Europe be in a position to play a role supporting democratic transition. Second, the EU must become a force for reconciliation between Islamic democratic forces and secular liberal groups. Third, it should provide economic and social support for the countries undergoing transitions, targeting Tunisia first and Egypt and Libya when elected gov governments are in place. Fourth, it should impose tough sanctions on Syria, recognizing the National Council of Syria and work with UN humanitarian organizations to protect the civilian, civilian population, particularly displaced people and refugees. It should also work with the BRIC countries to overcome their resistance to the UN Security Council taking action to protect civilians. And I would add a fifth point. Civil societies in Europe should be pushed to deepen interaction with their counterparts in the Arab world. In this respect, Turkey has already showed the way. In conclusion, the democratic uprisings in North Africa call for a radical shift in the EU approach to Euro-Mediterranean relations. Today, this approach needs to be essentially political and give a clear priority to the countries undergoing processes of regime change and democratization. But the EU also needs to take into, into account that the leaders of today's revolutions for dignity will not perceive relations with Europe in the same way that their predecessors did. They will be reluctant to agree to most forms of conditionality and will attempt to assert their, for their foreign policy autonomy, perhaps establishing deeper intra-regional relations, including with Turkey. The European neighborhood policy needs to give substance to its more political and pro-democracy orientation and to avoid economic models that can further deteriorate social conditions. The Union for the Mediterranean must be replaced by a new initiative that can be built on, that can be built on by reforming and democratizi democratizing countries. The priority must be strong political and economic support for democratic transition. The project of establishing a Euro-Mediterranean community of democratic states must be, must be discussed. As a long-term aim, this is the best option for the EU. The goal of establishing such Euro-Mediterranean community of democratic states could find support in the transi transitional democracies and in the liberal monarchies and would certainly be welcomed by sectors of southern civil societies. But a particular effort 
would be necessary to interest new sectors that are not the traditional secular interlocutors of the European NGOs. This proposal could help to restore EU credibility with Arab public opinion, showing that Europe has heard, has heard the call for freedom and democracy and is ready to respond. And I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Your Excellency. I'd be happy to take questions and comments from the audience. As always, when posing your question, if you can briefly stand and introduce yourself. That would be great. Thanks. My name is Elijah Bush, a PhD candidate from Jacobs University, Bremen. Um, I wondered if you might elaborate. Uh, you touched briefly at the end on this idea of uh, the EU reaching out to the BRIC countries. Um, and I would imagine including uh, Turkey. We often talk now of the T-BRIC countries. Um, but specifically with regard to these uh, humanitarian or human rights issues and the Security Council, are there any specific strategies or actions uh, mm -hmm. that you have in mind? If you could elaborate on that point, yeah. please. Yeah. Okay, well, thank you for that question, a very relevant one. Um, now, a little bit by coincidence, I think basically all of the BRICS are at this moment in the Security Council. Of course, uh, some of them are permanent members, but not all of them. But um, I think the other two BRICS are also at this moment in the Security Council, uh, Brazil and India, and, has, and have, of course, contributed a lot to the decision-making over the last months on a number of resolutions, or in fact, or impeded the decision-making on a number of resolutions. So we can, we can say, uh, of course, this is a personal opinion that especially uh, in India, but also in, well, especially in China, but also in India, Russia, South Africa, and uh, other countries of that size, I would say, that uh, they, in fact, they have uh, reflected in a different way than the West on a number of basic issues, and just to name one is the, the so-called responsibility to protect, a notion we, uh, we, we have discussed a lot here in Turkey over the last uh, couple of week, weeks and days. This is a notion dating back from 2005, uh, which has been elaborated uh, by Gareth Evans and ICG and other people, and uh, which has in fact, been in a way applied for the first time for Libya in the UN Security Council. So the UN Security Council resolution, uh, which has led to intervention in Libya, was based on that, on, on helping and protecting the, ci the civilians over there. Now, we all have seen also that the, the way things, uh, in fact, went uh, and in fact were, were sorted out in Libya were not e exactly according to the wishes of a number of um, international actors. A country such as Brazil and, and, and Russia and China are now arguing and, and have argued in New York in the Security Council that they don't want a repetition of what happened in Libya last year. Uh, we, the West, have been more uh, willing, and also Turkey, and more pushy to have an intervention and to, to do something in, in Syria, more than just sanctions. But the, the reaction of the BRICS in this point has been rather reluctant. This is also, to, I think, to do, especially in China, with a number of other things, like, uh, in fact, the nervousness about intervention in internal affairs, in domestic affairs. So that, that's definitely a very important point as well. In any case, this is what I, what, what I went, what meant with this. We have to work with the BRICS. And, and try and have a similar reading of security to protect and how we can help populations uh, which are really oppressed. Um, and if we can't find a, a, a common language, common interpretation of these notions, we, we, can't, we, we can get nowhere, especially that any international intervention, for instance in Syria, requires a, a mandate from the UN Security Council, including the BRICS. Thank you. Okay, additional questions or comments? Okay. Okay, well, if not, then uh, let's take this opportunity to express our sincere gratitude for an excellent uh, presentation from His Excellency Ambassador Paul DeWitt. Thank you very much. Okay.